go. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, uh, we started uh, talking about our identity, identity in Christ. We spoke about um, several things. Let me, uh, let me go to our passport. There we go. We spoke about our, how your occupation, your family, your wealth, your social status, your race, your gender, cultural group or circle of friends, your looks, your intelligence, your circumstances of the past, your hobbies, your favorite sports team, the number of likes you get on your Facebook. Don't, none of that defines you of who you are. It's only in Christ that we have our true identity. All right? So just to reset that a little bit. You are a beloved child of God, a co-heir with Christ. You're his masterpiece. He never leaves you or fakes you. You, you are his saint, his own son or daughter. You're washed, you're clean, you're redeemed, you're forgiven. And if you abide in him, God is not counting your sins. You're free. You're blessed. You're his special treasure. And you are complete in him. So don't ever forget who you are in him. Picture uh, Clark Kent at work one day. And suddenly he has a case of super amnesia. Right? He doesn't remember that he's Superman. He only thinks of himself as Clark Kent, which is a fake identity, not his real identity, I might add. He never attempts or thinks about flying as a possibility. And that's the way he lives that time of amnesia. But then his buddy Jimmy Olsen comes along, taps him on the shoulder, says, hey, you're Superman. If you go take off that suit, you're going to find you have another suit underneath it, a Superman suit. And guess what, bud? You could fly. Well, Clark would have to believe what he's being told and align himself to that truth. And then to do so, he'd probably rush into a phone booth. Oh, wait, we don't have those anymore. <laughs> Dating myself here. Uh, now he just like does it, I guess, at high speed, so you can't tell. But he has to put off the old Clark Kent fake identity and then once more, he could be who he is and fly as Superman. In the same way, Paul writes that we are the sons of God and we're clothed in Christ, having great power and none, none greater than to love as we are loved. But we have to put off our old clothes, our old identity, to see who we really are in Christ, to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. For your notes... Ephesians 4.24, Colossians 3.9 and 10, and Romans 13.14. I want to read a couple of those. They all talk about putting on the new man, right? And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's who you are. You're the new man or woman, created in righteousness and true holiness. Do you think of yourself as that, righteous? And truly holy. Colossians uh, verse that I mentioned says, Lie not one to one another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds. No longer do the deeds of the old man. And you've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. Right? And Romans uh, 13, 14 says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That's who you are in Christ. Let me... Uh, Swap over. Oops. No, no, I, you won't need it for this one. All right. I got, I'm trying to re figure out this new uh, thing where. Uh, where is everything? There you go. What's your identity crisis? You remember this animation from two weeks ago? Well, what's your identity? Christ is, right? All right. Back to Superman. The Superman story works, right? Because 
Everybody wants a savior. It's not Superman. It's Jesus Christ. Right? So, Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 129 also says, The folks that hated knowledge is because they didn't choose the fear of the Lord. Right? So, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of his holiness is understanding. And I think for our identity, that's what we have to recognize too. We need to know Him. And we're going to talk about knowing Him. And we're going to go further. Uh, I'm, there's going to be another, at least another part to this. But today we're going to lay some groundwork, I think, for the next one. Hosea 6, 6 and 7 says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of, the, of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. they they have dealt treacherously against me. So God wants us to desire knowledge of Him. God wants us to have eternal life. He gave His Son Jesus to reveal Himself to us in His fullness. When I read uh, this Hosea verse, I think of, uh, for your notes again, Matthew 9.13 and Matthew 12.7. Where Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's calling them to know God. Jesus had it. He had the knowledge of God, wouldn't you say? He understood where he came from. In uh, Isaiah 11, we read, in, starting in verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There they are again together. Our knowledge has to start with the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall judge after the sight, not, judge not after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Yeah, Jesus had it, right? We know this is about him. If you go back to verse 1, it talks about you know, the uh, branch out of, the, out of Jesse, right? So, Jesus knew and loved the Father, and by walking in the Spirit, because they were the two were one in the Spirit, right? I and you, and you and me, that he did not transgress. So for us, that fear of the Lord starts um, as a fear. You know, when we first start to come in, into faith, we're afraid of our sins and the punishment of our sins, right? And, but also, what outweighs that? What casts out fear? Perfect love. So when we get made aware that God sent his only son to die for us, and we see his perfect love, that casts out that fear in us, right? And he reconciles us to him. So we no longer have that dreaded fear, but now our fear is complete reverence, right? You know, some people try and say every time it says fear, it's only reverence. That's not true. You know, when the, the, a vision of Christ appeared before, you know, John, he fell on his face as if, we, if he were dead, you know? That, that there's, a, there's a healthy fear there. But as we are reconciled and believe what he says and we believe we're reconciled, we have no longer worry to, about, you know, dad's going to punish us, right? Because we believe him. And he said, hey, I did this so you could be one with me again. In Isaiah 53, we read, uh, talking about coming Messiah, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Is it the knowledge of the stuff Jesus knew that justifies us? No, right? Was it by Was it by his identity as the Son of God?
Yes, there was. He understood his purpose. He understood who he was, that he came from the Father, right? And he understood that the Father had given him work to do. And he proceeded to do it. So his knowledge of the Father and who he was, his identity in God, he was able to come and fulfill his role and justify us, right? He doesn't justify us by our works, but by our faith. Our faith in what? Our faith in the Son of God and his relationship with the Father and how he restores our relationship with the Father, right? So this is about knowing God. Jesus himself said in John 17, 3, and this is life eternal. Drum roll. That they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. God wants us to know him in a deep and intimate way. 1 John 5.13, these things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. He wants you to know it. To know you have eternal life, you have to know him. Remember when Jesus said you know, to those folks who came to him, hey, I've done many miracles in your name, I cast out demons, and he told them, your religious works mean nothing to me. I don't even know who you are. Get away from me, you worker of iniquity. What? They were working miracles? Casting out demons? Maybe even raising the dead? And yet, God didn't know them? Christ didn't know them? Be careful of what we think constitutes knowledge of God. Okay? Not on the screen, uh, but for your notes, John 20, 31. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. It's very crucial to know him. And we get to know God, the Father, through Jesus Christ. That's our main place to learn about him. Through Jesus Christ and through the scriptures and also through our own relationship with him. That's most important, which Jesus made possible for us. Again, Christ said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. And yet you won't come to me that you might have the life, right? See, Jesus told them, you can study the scriptures all you want, and it's never going to get you to salvation because you're either dismissing or misrepresenting what the scriptures say about me, him, right? <laughs> you need to come to me, he says, to know me. The invitation's open. And yet, you just want to swirl away and think that you know by the words and that you have eternal life. Jesus said that's not true. The devil knows his Bible pretty good, and he doesn't have eternal life. There's a lake prepared for him that is burning with fire. You know, Paul prayed, Paul prayed that the saints would know and understand God also, as Christ said, on a deeper level, a more intimate level. Not just by words on a page, like the Pharisees and scribes said they knew him, which Christ said, no, you really don't know him. Right? That doesn't make you know him. Let's, uh, let's, let me kind of precursor this uh, up in Ephesians. Verse, verse 3 through 14, if you look at it, in, in the Greek, it's like one long run-on sentence. It just keeps going. I, it's probably one of the longer sentences in the, in the book. Uh, but he unfolds that God has blessed us in every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And these blessings include being chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, who also has revealed to us God's eternal purpose. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And then Paul writes this, Wherefore, or for this reason, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Revelation doesn't have to be some kind of mystical vision. It's revealing. He's making you understand who he is. You do that through the relationship, listening to him, 
right? Paul's prayer shows us uh, that we should pray often for one another, right? And we talk about that a lot. That's how we, we show love for one another. Lay down our lives for a few minutes, enough to really care about somebody and pray for their needs, right? And with always first the kingdom in mind, right? We should also apply Paul's prayer to ourselves. Sometimes we pray, you know, Lord, heal me of this. Lord, get me a job. Lord, help me to do well in this. Well, there's nothing wrong, per se, with such prayers. They're rather shallow. And we ought to be praying more, Lord, as, as, as Paul does here, Lord, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowing you. I want to know you deeper. But after all, I'm becoming like you. You are making me like you. I should have a deep desire to know you because that's who I am becoming, right? Lord, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation of you. We should pray that God would grant his people to know him more deeply. I mean, Paul knew him, and yet he's saying, and these believers knew him. These believers, check it out. It says, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. They have faith and love, and Paul's telling them, hey, you need to know God on a deeper level. Is that something? That kind of blew my mind when I looked at that. It's like, wow. Because there's more. There's a deeper faith and a deeper love till we come to the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. And we get that through the relationship. There are many tricksters out there who will try and get you to do it by other works. And they'll sound all scriptural, but they're taking you away from the relationship. You'd be talking about him instead of talking with him. It's often been rightly said that uh, our walk, Christianity, discipleship, whatever you want to call it, is not a religion. It's a personal relationship with the living God, and that is true. But personal relationships don't run on autopilot. Can you do that with any one of your relationships? Just let it run without giving it any care? Even in the perfect Garden of Eden, Adam was created to tend and care for it, yet it was a perfect creation yet. Tend for Tend to it. Care for it. We have to do that with our relationships, too. It's easy to have an exciting relationship when you first fall in love. Anybody know about that? Yeah? <laughs> but it takes a full commitment past that to keep your marriage close and growing as the years go on. And the same is true in our relationship with God. When you first come to Christ... It could be new and exciting, right? The most powerful being in the universe, he sent his son to die for me. How glorious is that? That amazing grace, uh, you know, how wonderful it was the hour I first believed. You ever remember that? How, how awesome that felt? Well, you should feel that way all the time because that's still true. His grace is still amazing. While you were yet a sinner, he still poured out his love on you. And his son, obedient unto death for you. But it's easy to lose that first love and forget about it and grow distant in our relationships, like a husband and wife who sit in different rooms and don't talk all day. And then a problem comes up and they wonder why they can't talk about it. They're losing that knowledge of each other. They know of each other, but they're not taking the time to continue to know and grow, right? That's what a marriage is their whole life, right? You're going to learn and grow about and, and uh, learn about each other and grow in that and grow together. That's our relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father as well. You ever think about it with that? God often uses marriage as a model, earthly marriage as a model for us, so we can know about that. But it can become routine or ritual if we let it. I come, we have a little food, we listen to a prayer, and three hymns, a supersized sermon, uh, some more hymns and a, and a prayer, and then we have some dessert, and, and, and it could become rote to you. If that happens, that could be a warning sign 
to you, right? Don't let your relationship with him grow stale. And some of that is, you know, he dwells in each one of these saints here. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ is fellowshipping with us. Our fellowship is truly with them. And if we remember that, that should ignite that fire back, that first love for us. And we need to pray, like Jesus did and Paul did, for ourselves and for other believers that God may give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, to know him on that deep level, continually growing all our days. What will eternal, eternity be like with him? I don't know. I know I still won't know everything, right? But I look forward to that time getting to know him, right? I'm going to put you guys on the spot. New love. So you guys talk on the phone a lot, right? Yeah. Right? Why is that? To learn about each other, right? And you live 700 miles apart right now. <laughs> so in, part of that is talking. Part of that is listening, right? Because if you're just doing the talking part, you're not really communicating and you're, you're not really developing that relationship, right? So think about that with our relationship with God the Father, right? Now, Jesus Christ died to give us that access so we can pray directly to the Father. Do we just use it to thank him for our food at mealtime or to say, hey, I, I, this is broken my life, fix it? How would your spouse feel if that's all you came to them for? Hey, where's my lunch? Hey, thanks for making my lunch, all right? That's not a relationship. You expect me to eat this slop? <laughs> you burn the toast. Our relationship with God came at a huge price. Right? We shouldn't squander that. Talk to him. He's with you and in you. I know it may seem odd. Maybe you don't want to do it out loud because you'll think people think you're weird, like somebody's singing in their car with their windows rolled up and you can't tell that they're singing. You're like, are they singing or just <laughs> being odd? <laughs> but you can pray quietly, but you should pray. Notice how Jesus kept going away from the crowds to seek time to be alone. Do we do that? To be alone with God? After the services, these guys are going to kind of squirrel away. I've seen it for a few weeks now. They're going to kind of squirrel away and talk about you know, to each other a little bit more to get to know each other more. Why shouldn't we be doing that with our relationship with God? Right? That's the deeper knowledge of him that we're being called to. And it says it in the scripture. I can say, I know God. I do know God. Hey, that reminded me. Where's Brian? That reminded me of Josh. Remember telling his teacher in school? Right? No, you're wrong. You don't know God. My father knows God. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I don't know why I thought of that, but <laughs> I know God, but Paul and Christ are both telling me I can yearn and I should be yearning for a deeper knowledge of him through that relationship. And that should continue to grow. It is the love affair of through all time, the greatest love affair of all times, God's love for us, God's love for you, right? That's awesome. Paul continues in Ephesians. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of, his, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Again, these believers are walking in faith and love. And Paul says, you need more of him. You still need more of him. You are complete in him, but you still need more of him. That's that desire for the relationship has to continue. So Paul asks uh, 
that God opened the eyes of their hearts so that they would know all the wonderful things about what God is doing for them, the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, the inheritance that we as co-inheritors get with Jesus Christ. And the amazing power, exceeding greatness of his works towards us. He continues again in verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet, Jesus Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And we're going to visit a few other verses about Christ being the fullness. Uh, and, and I know you know this. And we'll see those in a bit. Because God wants us to know not only him, but his son. It's actually through his son that we do know him. And Paul again in Ephesians said, Till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The knowledge of the Son of God, there it is again. He's saying we need to get to that. Remember when Paul, Paul talked about, I, I don't count as I have apprehended yet, but I keep going after and pursuing. That's what he's talking about. Pursuing Christ that way. Like this pursuit going on here, right? Pursuing him, right? You guys pursue each other, right? Pursue before you got married, and now you continue to pursue, right? Pursue one another. Pursue him, right? That's our walk till we come to the fullness of Christ. How well did, does Jesus Christ know the Father? Perfectly, doesn't he? Perfect knowledge of him. And that's where God wants us to be too. In his time, over time. Enjoy the journey of that relationship. When you're in a relationship, you enjoy that journey as well, don't you? I mean, that's part of what causes the excitement. It's when that you've gotten through a bulk of that or initial learning, that's when you worry about that, that you've lost that, that, that flame. But love is a choice, right? God chose to love us while we were yet unlovable. Love is a choice, and we have to continue to pursue that love. Philippians, a lot of words on the screen there. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything else is worthless, he says. Wow. Well, we know about Jesus, right? We know all these, these facts about him because we read the book. But that's not knowing him. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Do you see a trend here? Seeking to know him closer in these scriptures? Has that ever popped out at you before? Or you're, you're like, oh, I know him. Now we're just studying these doctrines. Be careful. Like I said, the devil knows doctrine real well. Know him. That way if somebody says, hey, did you hear that about Brian? And I could say, I know Brian, and I know that's not true of him. Okay. Know him. First Corinthians fifteen thirty four. We will talk about this uh, sporadically through the rest of the message too. Writing to Corinth, he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. He's writing to the church, to God's people. And he's saying, some of you don't have the knowledge of God that you should have. 
Because when you have the true knowledge of God, you will awake to your righteousness in Him, and you will not sin. You will no longer be walking after those things. You will be walking after and pursuing Him. New love, sorry. Are you guys going to pursue other people? Oh, so you can't do that in a relationship? You can't pursue other things. You have to pursue each other, right? Together, like together. That's what we're supposed to be doing with him. Awake to righteousness. He is righteous. He is holy. He doesn't sin. He is in you. How are you supposed to walk? Now, if you're just trying to be righteous by the letter of the law, you will fail. If you guys are just going through the motions, you will fail. You have to count on and trust the relationship, the love that you have. Right? You didn't know you'd be on the spot, sitting up front row too. Perfect perfect for me. <laughs> it's a great illustration, actually. So I thank you. <laughs> the spotlight's not on you, it's on him. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you have a true knowledge of God, you won't sin habitually, right? You may kind of forget in the moment and stumble now and then, and we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. But you're going to be walking more like him. And it's true, as a couple grows together over time, they start to pick up some traits of one another, right, over time. Think about that with our relationship with him. Isn't that that's what it's supposed to be? Second Corinthians ten, four through six, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of holes, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. These thoughts are coming in and trying to exalt themselves against your knowledge of God that God has given you so you forget Him, so you fall and, and, and you commit sin. Because the devil wants you distant from the Father. He wants you to return to that vomit. God says, no, you're my son, you're my daughter, and I am dealing with you differently now. I am dealing with you as sons and daughters. Uh, let me finish the verse. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Are we supposed to be obedient? Are we supposed to cast down everything that goes against the knowledge of who Christ says we are and, and who God is? Are we supposed to walk in holiness? Why do we believe we're Clark Kent still? Right? If you keep the knowledge of who God is and who Christ is and who you are in Christ, you can cast down every machination that causes you to sin. Every. If you remember who you are, you won't sin. If that's who you really are. So who are you? Because if you don't believe those things, that's unbelief. That is sin. You have to believe all the things we went over in part one. You are his. You are redeemed. You are loved. He's not counting your sins. He is for you, not against you. He has a future plan for you that he already knows, the end thereof. He's got your name written in his book. And yet, uh, yeah, that's not me, because I still do this and this. Stop it. Remember who you are and act like that. Remember who you are, and you will not walk astray. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Again, Paul writing to the Colossians, prays with the other saints that those saints in Coloss would also be filled with the knowledge of God and his will. Let's read it, starting in verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing and being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. You think God wants us to increase in the knowledge of him? 
A lot of scriptures, right? I took out lots of slides too, by the way. Because I know God's patience is long, but maybe yours isn't. So Let's continue in Colossians. Verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So again, he talks about knowledge of God, and then he tells you who you are. And when you know who you are in him, you will continue to pursue that relationship. That's our eternity. And this also reveals the father love. Look at he's what he's done for us. While we are yet as enemies, he brings us near to him by the blood of Christ and makes us partakers of the inheritance with his holy ones. He makes us his holy ones. That's awesome. Don't ever forget who you are in him. Continuing, he says, who is the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Spirit world, angels, by him all things exist, whether visible or invisible. So we see here that Christ is the exact representation of the Father through the Spirit. And uh, finally, uh, wrap up Colossians 1 in verses 18 through 20. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, amen, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be in things in earth or things in heaven. Again, we see that the fullness of the Father dwells in the Son, the perfect representation of His being. And we are supposed to be transformed daily by the renewing of our mind through the Spirit to become just like them. If I wanted to become like Jeff, Brother Jeff, wouldn't I have to spend time with him to get to know his mannerisms, his traits, the things that he likes and dislikes? Okay? Relationship. Relationship. Jump into Colossians 3.10 and says, We have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The NLT reads it this way, Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That's what renews us. Seeking Him, pursuing Him. Ephesians 4.24, that you put on the new man which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Knowing God and who we are through His Son is paramount to our walk of faith. If we modeled the Father, <laughs> if we modeled the Father after an earthly father, are we doing right? Because even the best of earthly fathers would fall short, right? We're setting up a false God, a false image created after the image of man. We're creating God after the image of man. So I know so not everybody had the greatest earthly father, right? So when you picture the father, don't picture him, liken him to man. Liken him to what we saw in Jesus Christ and what we see of God through the scriptures. You know, a couple of weeks back, I, we did a little exercise and I asked people to, to picture God standing in front of you right now. What does he look like? Well, some folks would say that, you know, he's angry. He's looking at you like, what have you been doing? I know what you've been doing, right? Things like that. That is not how he perceives us. We are modeling him after our earthly fathers. He reconciled us completely 
And he's no longer treating us as enemies or servants, slaves, but as sons and daughters because that's his love for us. And he cannot lie, so we know this is true. And we need to, that's where our faith comes in, to believe him. It's pretty easy to have faith in somebody who cannot lie and is holy and complete and just, right? So it really is simple, although sometimes it seems like we struggle so much to get there. God wants us to have peace. Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and, our, and Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to the life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Virtue. Pull up a quick picture here if I can. Right? N-O, God, N-O, peace. Right? If you're missing that peace in your life, it's because you're not as closely as you should. Remember on the boat, you know, Jesus is the exact representation of, of our Father. When he was in the boat and the storm was coming, was he afraid? No, he was asleep on a pillow. That's pretty comfortable. That's complete faith and trust in God. God's not surprised by anything that happens in our life. He doesn't panic. Oh, no. What's Ron going to do now? <laughs> That's why we're supposed to pursue knowing him. Because if we know him... We will have that peace that he wants us to have. And that peace will surpass all understanding. So continuing uh, in this, uh, so he says, peace be most of you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he's hammering that home. This is where you get your peace. And it's multiplied by your knowledge of him. To stay in him, know who you are in him. And then again, Everything that you have that pertains to life and godliness is through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. Now, before you, you think that it's just the scriptures, remember the Pharisees and scribes had the scriptures and they didn't know Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ says, if you don't know me, you don't know the Father either. Those who claim they have the Father and not the Son, they are antichrist. Okay? I'm not saying they're worse than you or me. I'm just telling you as a fact, they are what the Bible calls an antichrist. They do not have eternal life. You cannot have eternal life without Jesus Christ. Well, how did they have it before Jesus Christ came as a man? Well, it was based on that same faith that we have in Jesus Christ after the fact. They look forward, we look back. It's no different. He is the creator. Let's uh, continue in verse 4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and temperance patience, and to patience godliness. And it's continued on the next slide, but I want to pause here. So he says that these great promises that are exceeding and great and precious, are made so that we can know him and that we might also be partakers of his nature, the divine nature. That's his nature. He gave us a spirit. And through that spirit, we should have escaped the corruption that's in the world through desire. Lust, people always think sexual when they think lust. Lust is any illicit desire, okay? So uh, maybe should when you read that, you should read illicit desire, which is anything. You can watch... You can want some things that are good more than you want God, and that's illicit. That's wrong. That's another God before him. But then he wants us to add. Giving diligence. We have to be diligent at this. He wants to add to our faith virtue, which is valor or excellence. 
He wants you to be valorous, like the mighty men of David, right? They were mighty men of valor. And I don't mean in the physical sense that they were, but in the spiritual sense. You have the power to tread on scorpions, to slay dragons, if you will. And to add to virtue, knowledge. Again, knowledge coming to the forefront. Not knowledge as in gnosis. Again, Satan seals up the sum full of wisdom. He knows the scriptures better than you do. He could probably recite them backwards and forward in every language that was ever created. But he doesn't know God. Not in the saving way that we know him. Or he, if he really knew him, and we'll get to a passage that, that helps describe him as well as, as us before our conversion and other people. But I don't want to jump, jump ahead. Let's finish this passage uh, and add to godliness brotherly kindness and brother kindly, kindness love. Why? Because these are, the, these are the attributes of our Father. And as we are learning to be like Him, we are getting, not gaining a knowledge of Him, we are becoming like Him. So these things are growing in us. For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and knowledge of our Father that we get those things. Sometimes he puts those, uh, those sayings kind of backwards. And you could think, well, I have to do, be kind and brotherly and do all these things. But no, it's through the knowledge of who Christ is and who you are in Christ and that the Father dwells in you through the Spirit that you can produce that fruit because it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the Ken or the George or the you know, Julie or Mary. The fruit of the Spirit. Uh, actually, uh, I don't have it on this, uh, on this, but nine, verse 9 and 10, it says, But he that is failing to develop in this way or lacking these things is blind and can't see. So if we're lacking those things in the fruit of the Spirit and seeking the knowledge, we're blind and we can't see. Give diligence to your calling, it says. And if you do these things, you shall never fail. Seek and pursue him with all your might. He's not running away from you. You're just growing to know him on a deeper level. Just as a relationship, at first it starts off superficial. Maybe you're attracted to something or some aspect person. But you don't know them yet. You can't say you know them. But you start to learn to know them. And that's kind of exciting. And then it grows and grows and grows and should continue all the days of your life. And we had talked about um, in... Second Peter 1, we talked about escaping the pollutions. And uh, he talks about it again in, in chapter 2. He says, For if they have escaped, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they're again entangled there and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. You can overcome the pollutions of the world through your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not knowing about him, but knowing him. And knowing him, conforming yourself to the likeness of him. And again, God does all that work. He does that work within us. All we have to do is submit to him in love. But to escape the pollutions, we must know him. To stay free, we must continue in him. To continue to know him as Lord of our lives as well as just our Savior. He saved me, now I can do what I want. He didn't save you to continue in that way. He saw you had compassion on you, pulled you up, washed you off, cleaned you off. He doesn't want you running back to that mud. He says, I got better plans for you. Because I love you. Come with me. Learn about me. Know me. I am an eternal life. And I've given you eternal life with me. You got a lot of time to get to know me. So how about starting now? You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. 
Peter again tells us to continue to grow in that relationship and that knowledge of him. Otherwise, you could be led away with the error of the wicked. Why? Because anything that's not of faith is sin. There are many things that sound good and can trip you up. There are many religious traps out there to get you. You know you were saved by grace, and then they can get you to go about trying to establish your own righteousness. Where you spend your life just trying, I'm going to do this, and it'll be pleasing to God. I'll, I'll do this. Why? You don't believe God that he already said you're pleasing to me? I washed you, I made you clean, I made you complete? Oh, you want to seek it by your own works. Hmm, you have forgotten. Don't you know me, he says? You follow? We do that. We do that. Have you, you know, begun in the spirit now that to continue or go return to the flesh? What does knowing God look like? Isaiah 58, 2 says, Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook sook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice, and they take delight in approaching to God. Does that describe you? Yes, I seek him daily in that relationship not just in reading a daily reading plan. Prayer, prayer consists of two ears and one mouth. should listen twice as much as you speak. Let your words be few, right? For the earth is his footstool. Delight to know his ways. Or do you still covet the things of the world? This is what knowing him looks like. When you know him, you'll seek him and you will Delight to know his ways, and you will do righteousness. And you take delight in approaching him daily. All right, a new relationship. You guys take delight in approaching each other to see each other? All right, see, okay. So that's testimony what a relationship is, right? So you should be, this is what it looks like. And here's another advantage. I threw this in there, but Daniel 11, 32 and such shall do wickedly against the covenant, and he shall corrupt by their flatteries. But the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits or miracles. There's some advantages to knowing God. So this is where I said we were going to go. <clears throat> this is about how you can lose knowing him. Just like a husband and wife, if they grow distant... They live basically separate lives. Lives. It's not going to work. In Romans 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him, that, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead are able to be understood, so that they are without excuse. You're like, oh, well, they don't know God. Well, wait a minute. He says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. When husband knew wife, and he didn't glorify his wife and wasn't thankful for his wife. But he became vain in his imaginations. His foolish heart was darkened. Professing himself to be wise, he went astray as a fool, right? If we are not thankful, it's a sign that we are losing our knowledge of him, right? Thankfulness really needs to be a core. I mean, if you read through here, everywhere, it's thanks and praise to God. another way you know that you are knowing him he continues in the verse 8 let's drop there and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient they became haters of God even right if you are walking in sin 
giving yourself over to becoming a reprobate, it's because you are not liking to retain God in your knowledge. You are not seeking and pursuing him. You are seeking and pursuing other things. Yes? Because if you are pursuing him, you won't go after those other things. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And yet, these people know the judge of God, but they don't know God. They've chosen to not know him. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge in Romans 10. Because they haven't submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Let me lead into to this. John 14, verse 1. Jesus speaking said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, or offices. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go... You know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How could we know the way? And Jesus answered on our screen and said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man is coming to the Father but by me. He is the door. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him, and you have seen him. And Philip's like, what? Say what? I didn't hear. I didn't hear. Show us the Father and it'll suffice us. Weren't you just listening? Weren't you just listening, Philip? And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long a time with you and yet you have not known me? Whose words did Jesus see? The Father's, right? Whose works did Jesus do? The Father's. Whose words do you speak? And whose works do you do? Hmm. Have I been with you so long a time, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how do you say you then show us the Father? Believe you not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Just what we said. Words and actions from the Father. Jesus was sent so we may be reconciled and thereby know the Father. He revealed him in himself because the Father dwelt in him. You know, there are many other scriptures that tell us that God the Father sent his Son into the world to accomplish his purpose. In fact, in John, there's more than 30 verses that say the Father sent the Son, and another 14 verses says, uh, the one who sent me, or Jesus says, he, the one who sent me. That's... God wants us to know that he sent him so we could have faith in him through Jesus Christ. During Jesus' ministry, it was revealed that he was the Son of God. And then he went on to reveal the Father. John 1, uh, 18, No man has seen God at any time, only the begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, has declared Him. That's how you know Him. John 17, 26, I have declared unto them your name and will declare it that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them and I in them. I'm de declaring who you are to them through my words and my actions, what Jesus is saying. And not on the screen, add... Uh, John 17, 4. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. Jesus shows us what God the Father's like. He shows us the Father's love, his compassion, his mercy. He shows us God's righteousness, his humility, his authority, his words, his work, his truth, even his glory. In Jesus Christ, the Father is made visible so we can know him. 
He makes the invisible visible. We worship a Father who is very much like the Son. He's revealed in the Son. Although the Father is greater than the Son, says the words, they're also one. And we are one with Him. That takes us back to part one about knowing your identity in Him. If you remember that you are His and the price that was paid for you, you won't be able to help but to want to seek and know this God of love better and more intimately. And thereby, that love will drive you so you're not, you're not looking anymore at the others. You're not looking at the other things. You have, your eye is single, focused on Him. Because He loves you. What can separate you from His love? Not on the screen, but, but write it down. Now, Romans 8, 33 and 34. Romans 8, 33. Uh, actually, go through 39. That's probably the most important part of the message today. I'm going to read it to you. Romans 8, starting in verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God's not counting your sins. Who else? Who's going to, if God's for you, who's against you? Who can say, oh, yeah, yeah, he did this. That's bad. God, God, you don't know him. What are you doing? Nobody can lay anything to the charge of God's elect. It is God that is justifying. Who is he that is condemning? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who's making intercession for us. Do you believe that? Then believe it and walk in that holiness. Guilt should only drive you to repentance, and after that, that guilt should be gone if you're believing that you are cleansed and forgiven. It's not that he's hiding your sin, he's, he's vanquished it. Verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long, and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these things, all these trials, tribulations, persecutions, all this, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know that and believe it? Then why do you feel like such a failure at times? Why do you feel you have to earn his approval? He loves you and is treating you as his sons and daughters. Don't you believe him? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught about the Father and what kind of love the Father has. Uh, just some brief excerpts here. Matt 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Do you do that? Do you love people who are your enemies, who set themselves as your enemy? Do you bless them when they curse you? Or you try to defend yourself? Do you do good to them that hate you? Do you pray for them when they use you and persecute you? Why should we do all those things? Well, verse 45, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. You want to be like Him? This is where you got to be. Here, I'll give you my spirit so you could do it. He makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Does He love the others, the evil and the good? Isn't He good to them? Even though they're His enemies, still gives them rain and food. Doesn't he care for them more than the sparrows? Gives them an opportunity to embrace the Son and know him more? 
They know him through the creation, but he, he invites them to know more. But it was only those who accept that he's able to draw into that closer relationship because the relationship takes two. God's not dictating it to us. He could have created robots. He could have pre-programmed us with complete knowledge of him and complete uh, obedience to him. That's not a relationship. That's a program. That's software. Jesus taught us to be just like the Father when he read us off verse 44. Can he be trusted to take care of you? Yes, he can. Uh, Matt 6, 8 for your notes. Be you not therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. <coughs> and then, of course, the parable with the, the flowers that neither toil nor spin, and yet they're clothed in beauty. And the sparrows, who is being fed. Jesus told us a little bit more about the Father. I mean, so many ways. All his parables talked about the Father so much. We're going to read one, and you're familiar with it. Right? We actually read it more, not more than a couple months ago as well. But um, the doctrine of God as a Father is a gradual, un, a gradual revealing throughout the Old Testament into the New. It receives its full understanding in the New. I'll give you examples. The, Father, God as the Father is mentioned in the Old, Old Testament in certain, like about 15 times. And they're kind of vague and veiled. But the New Testament gives a total of 257 references that God is our Father. John, the Gospel writer, no less uh, mentions him no less than 129 of those times. Because John is the writer of love. He was the disciple that Jesus loved too, right? So... Jesus revealed the Father to his disciples and by extension, his future followers, us. How did he do that? In two basic ways that I can see, and you may divide it some other way. Through his teachings and through his conduct. What he said and what he did, right? That's how you learn about someone. Relationship, folks. That's how you learn about what, what people say and then how they act, right? And you can compare the two and see if they match, right? Okay, all right. Just making sure. Thanks. <laughs> so let's look at one of the teachings from Jesus about the Father. And let us revisit the parable of the prodigal son. Only this time we're going to call it the parable of the welcoming father. And let us see the Father through the words that God inspired in Jesus to say. Luke 15, starting in verse 11, he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. I want my inheritance. I want it now. I don't want to wait till you have to die for it. I want it now. It's mine. Oh, really? Is it really yours? Or is it the father's? Hmm. And he divided him unto them his living. Nice father. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey to a far country, and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed his swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly. He, he would have just, he made him, what them pigs are eating is good. Let me just eat some of that. But no man gave it to him. That, my friends, is you. Before you came to know God through Jesus Christ. When you had your fill, finally, of this sin-sick world, and you found your emptiness, then you remembered your Father in heaven. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arrive. I will go to my father. And I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no more worthy to be called your son. So make me one of your hired servants. Yeah, maybe he'll go for that. Right? He's rehearsing his lines along the way. Well, what am I going to say to him? Oh, man. 
I, I, I really blew this. Man, he, he could condemn me. I know he's not going to take me back as his son. He'd be like one of his servants. They got more than I got now anyway. He didn't really know his father, did he? But he came towards him to know him. And he arose and he came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. He didn't get the chance to say, hey, let me make me your servant. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Notice your father's actions. Was he abusive to you as the prodigal returning? Did he throw it in your face? Oh, well, now, see, now you're coming back. Did, did he do that to you? Did he wait for the son to come grovel at his feet? No, he ran to him. The father ran to him. All the, the son had to do was turn and start to come towards him. And he saw him a great way off. And he ran to him. That's the love the father has for you. He didn't do any works of righteousness up to that point. But he confessed that he was a sinner and he needed the Father's love. The Father was compassionate. He embraced and kissed him. Did he make him only a hired servant then? No. Rather, the Father restores him and gives him full sonship. He puts the best robe on him. He puts a ring on his hand to signify he is of the household. And he puts shoes on his feet. He made him royalty, if you will. And that's what the Father did for you. You did nothing for that, except come to the end where you realized who you were without him and who you could be in him. Don't forget who you are in him. You already have the robe and the ring and the shoes. The robe and the ring and the shoes should remind you who you are. Princess Diaries, the Superman suit. Remember who you are. First John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, you are his beloved. So that doesn't just fill your heart. I don't know what will. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that is loving is born or begotten of God and is knowing God. Oh, if you love, you know God. And he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It's not going to be all the scripture you can quote. It's not. It's not going to be your preciseness of doctrine. One who, if you love, it's because he's begotten you of the Spirit. Again, he's doing the works. So you've got nothing to boast in even there. But that's how you know God. There's, there's another way, too, which we're, we'll read. And they're, they're tied together. But first I wanted to plug, Brian had uh, spoken before about taking the first Corinthians and putting your name in there. Well, I put God in there. God is love. So I'm going to take out the word love, put the word God in there. All right? God is patient and kind. God doesn't envy. He's not jealous. He doesn't brag. He's not proud. He doesn't behave himself inappropriately. He's not irritable. He keeps no record of being wronged, right? Takes no account of evil. You can't provoke him. He doesn't rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out.
God never gives up. He never loses faith. He's always hopeful, deserves all things, uh, uh, endures all things, all circumstances. He is God. This is the love God has given us through the Spirit. So put your name in there. Are you patient? Are you kind? Well, if you're not, maybe you're not seeking that relationship to be conformed to His image. It is through the Spirit that these things come out. Again, it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the John or Mary. It's a gift from Him. Our lot is to believe Him. To believe. To have faith. Love is one of the ways we know Him. How do we know we know Him? There's a list of activities up on the screen. Do any of the following list of activities show that we know God if you do them? Talking about God. Does that mean you know Him? Singing songs about or to God? Donating time to help others? Maybe running a soup kitchen? Feeding the hungry? Volunteering at church? Listening to godly music. Oh, that means you know him? No, no, not so much, maybe. No. Belonging to a congregation. Reading books about him. Socializing with godly people. Does that make, mean that you know him? Leading a small group. Or Bible studies, maybe. Having some kind of title. Right? Serving a role as a pastor, elder, deacon, whatever. That means you know him? Being a speaker in an assembly. Donating to a church or a Christian group. That means you know him? No. Posting scripture or memes about the Bible on social media? No. No. <laughs> a lot of hate-filled people do those things too. That aren't filled with the love of God. Now, don't get me wrong. This list is filled with wonderful things. What we might consider godly activities. And as a Christian, this list represents things we may have in our life because we already know God and have accepted His Son as our Savior. Good works come naturally as a result of who we are and who we're becoming. But sadly, for those who don't know God and want to know Him through these things, they try and do these things to get to know Him, that's works. And you're not going to get to know Him through these things. These are activities and things that you do after you know Him. But you're not going to get to know Him through doing those things. Many workers of iniquity do good things. Often, people feel like, oh, I should do them. If you're having that compulsion, maybe it's because God wants you to know Him first. And you're trying to fill that God-shaped hole with something different that sounds godly. Denying uh, or having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Right? You follow? This le list represents works to them people. Things we do because we feel like we should. They don't serve as a litmus test though that we know God. And we often confuse these things as the way God's revealing himself to us or as an indicator we know him. But that's not true. When a person truly knows God, this list then will take on a new meaning. And will become worship to, to God. Genuine. But it is because you know God first. And that is why these works come. It's a different aspect of our spirit. A different aspect of our relationship with God the Father. And Jesus Christ the Son through the Spirit. Through the Spirit we manifest the good works. Sometimes we put the cart before the horse. If I do these things, that's what a Christian does. Then I'll be one. No. Believe in God and who He says you are in the Spirit that He's placed in you. And then the works will follow. No cart before the horse. This is how God says we know Him another way. It's no different than the first. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. You know what I'm going to do, right? Period. Stop. Don't read past that yet. 
I'm writing to you so you don't sin. Does God want you to sin? Does God expect you to continue in sin all the days of your life? It's not what he says, is it? I write to you that you sin not. Now, if you just try and don't sin, again, we went over this before, by the letter of the law, you'll fail because you're not doing it right. You're putting the cart before the horse. The love of God and the belief in what He is doing in you will manifest the works where you will not desire the things that the flesh, that the old Clark Kent would, would worship. Right? Now we can continue. All right. The expectation is don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Oh, okay. Now it sets things in proper order. Otherwise, we become licentious. We think, well, I'm going to continue this. I'm going to do this all my days of my life. It doesn't say that. You are not believing God when you say that. Now, will you be perfect? No. Okay. But you, you can be through the Spirit. Because if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There will be no sin. But He knows our frame. So He built in that forgiveness through his son Jesus. Now, does that mean you don't have to repent of something that you do? Because Jesus got it? Yeah, Jesus got it. I don't have to work. No. If you don't find repentance, right, you're not going to be forgiven. But he's not looking, he's not looking for you, to, God's not looking for you to do something wrong. So he, ah, got you, you're out, you're out of the family. He didn't do that. Is that what the prodigal father, son's father did? <laughs> I'm sorry, man, you blew it. Go eat that pig food. He didn't do that. And Jesus Christ is the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world, if they will come to him. Any, there's no sin that he can't cover if they come to him. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And we know his commandments aren't grievous, right? We know that we know him because we keep his commandments. By letter of the law. Keeping his commandments doesn't mean you're going to know him. The scribes and the Pharisees had the law. They kept outward commandments, even stretched them. Hey, I'm even going to tithe on things like you know, the little herbs in my window pot. But they didn't know him. To the knowing him, you will love him because he first loved you. You will love Him. And through the loving of Him and the abiding in Him, you will keep His commands. It's a natural reaction from having the indwelling of the Spirit and remembering who you are in Christ. It can be a very touchy subject for people to capture. But if you remember who you are in Christ, you will be on much more solid ground. Let's continue. Verse 4. He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Can I go and just transgress and do whatever I want to do? No. It means you don't know him. If you want to do those, you need to get on your knees and say, Lord, I need to know you more fully. But whoso is keeping his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Right. Does anyone read that as this? If your love is perfected, then we will keep his word. Read it. Whoso keeps his word in him is barely the love of God perfected. Remember, sometimes it gets written kind of where you're like cart before the horse. If your love is perfected, then we will keep his word. And hereby we know that we are in him. He that says that he is abiding in him ought to himself walk even as he walked. Now, that doesn't mean you have to wear sandals, even though it's cool if you do. <laughs> it means that you need to know and love God as Jesus Christ did and believe in him and believe what the work he has done and the spirit that is in you can make you overcome all things. God We've called things God's plan. God doesn't have a plan. Plans can fail. Plans are things that men do and then they make a plan A and a plan B. God has an eternal purpose. Yes? 
Can God's plan fail? No, then it's not just a plan. It's his eternal purpose and his will shall be done. What's his will for you? Do you know? God made it really easy for somebody to know him. He wrote everything he wanted us to know about him in the Bible. And he reveals his plan or right, purpose for us. And he tells us who he is. He tells us who his son is. He tells us who we are in Christ. He gave us of his spirit. He took up residence inside of us. Talk about a major rehab, house flipper, right? If we want to know him, we must lay aside all our pride, all our worldly wisdom, all our intelligence, and approach him as children. As infants, if you will. Remember Brian talked about when, he, uh, when you fast, he talked about hungering and thirsting for righteousness and he pictured that baby for you. The hunger and thirst. Ah, I need, I need, I gotta have. That's the way you should be for God. Can you go a couple of days without him? Mm, fasting from God isn't a good idea. That's a fasting you don't want to do. If we want the Lord to disclose himself to us, you know, we had read that in uh, John 14, 21, Jesus said, At that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that has my commandments and is keeping them, he it is that is loving me. And he that is loving me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. As I said, God has a general love for everyone. Enough to send his son to die for them. But those who have faith in his message, he, has, he draws them closer into a special relationship. Let's put that out. That's the scripture I just read. We understand that there's a special intimate love reserved for those who obey him. It's only in those close love trust relationships that we would he will reveal himself more to us. Love him, seek him and you will be more obedient and just naturally. You won't have to try to be obedient. The Spirit in you will do the work. He, the Father does the work. We just need to yield to Him and seek Him. There's that intimate closeness that He draws us to. The people of the world don't have. We are His special treasure. And we understand this principle from our physical relationships, our carnal relationships, if you will. You only disclose your heart to those whom you trust, don't you? I mean, if you walk up to a stranger and start revealing a lot of personal matters, they're going to go, hmm, this person's weird, and walk away, right? Probably, right? Yeah, and I got this right here, and it was, all right, I don't know you, man. Hi, my name is Ken. I'm a Christian. <laughs> Intimate personal disclosure is reserved for those you know well, isn't it? And you know, I've talked about we need to be more vulnerable to each other and open ourselves up to one another in that way. Uh, I'm talking about the same thing. Intimate personal disclosure is reserved for those we know well who are trustworthy of that information. And that same principle is true spiritually. David wrote in Psalm 25, the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make them to know his covenant. Maybe, maybe you're a, uh, you know, a reader, and a, maybe a, a, a history buff, or, or if you will, and maybe you've read a lot about, you know, one of our presidents in the past. Name one, pick one. We'll use, let's use Trump for the first one. 
You've read a lot about Donald Trump. You know many detailed facts about his life and up to his current state of his presidency. But most of you have probably never met him. You do not know him personally. Knowing him personally involves knowing many facts about him, sure, but involves more, doesn't it? Personal knowledge involves a relationship, time being spent together. Spend time with your creator. Read his word believing. You can't just have an academic knowledge of your theology of God. Although scripture is necessary in the process of knowing God. In fact, every true insight into God's nature will be fully consistent with what's in the Bible. But many people have a Bible and don't know him. Many people can quote it better than you or I and do not know him. The scribes and the Pharisees knew their scrolls. They searched them, for they thought they had eternal life in them, but they didn't know him who has life. You do. We should be reading, studying, meditating, and praying over the Scripture. Be careful that you don't seek knowledge of these things, a doctrinal, as a replacement for the relationship. Christ died so we have direct access to the Father, not a small price to pay. We should be praying, and we should be praying for a personal knowledge of God himself through Jesus Christ, who has revealed him to us. And he is the only way to the Father. Are you growing to know God personally through Jesus Christ? Or is it just a knowledge thing? You come... You hear a sermon, you read some scripture. Yeah, now I'm a little smarter about these things. Well, this is a book about him. Can you consider, consider it God's autobiography? But if you read the autobiography of Barack Obama, that doesn't mean you know him, does it? If you read the autobiography of Ronald Reagan, you know things about him, things about him, but you don't necessarily know him that takes personal contact prayer spending time in his words a priority is it a priority to you to seek after him is prayer a priority or is it just oh, that's one of those necessities i know i gotta do it so again i'll do it at meals i'll do it at services and that's it does it become an i want list these are signs if they are, those are signs you need to know God in a more intimate level. And that's what we should be praying for. I pray that for each of you, that you get to know God deeper and deeper throughout your entire life to grow together in that relationship, just as we, is pictured in a husband and wife. The simple good news of the scripture is that God, through the Spirit, wants us and will help us to know him better. Is that awesome? God wants you to know him better. He's drawing you closer to himself. While you were a great way off, he ran to you and he's pulled you in. Put on that robe and that ring and those slippers. God seeks a relationship with you. He's calling you sons and daughters. Is that not something? That's amazing. That's who you are. We should pray that God gives us the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of him. How will you know that you're knowing God? Well, you can say, am I becoming more like Christ? Yeah, I made a quart of whips and ran the money changers out of the temple. Well, okay. <laughs> he had a zeal for his father's house. Do you have a zeal for his father, your father's house? How do you treat the temple of God? Do you realize that you are holy, a holy vessel? How do you treat a holy vessel? Again, I use the, the description of you're your father's favorite cup. Golden cup. Service in the temple. 
in your golden cup, but you don't take that cup and use it to dig in the garden with or scoop sewage. You treat that cup holy because you know what it is. Know who you are. And then you will walk in holiness because you remember who you are in Christ. It is He that does the work and you won't have... That's why you're struggling, struggling and falling all the time. Because you're trying of your own strength to do these things rather than getting to know Him and becoming more like Him through that transformation of the Spirit. You can ask, am I becoming more affectionate towards those around me, especially in the church? Do I care for them and the things of their life? More importantly, that they have a relationship with God the Father. Because that's a sign that I know God the Father. Right? And then, knowing God the Father, you'll be more empowered to talk to others and confess, Jesus is the Son of God, and here's what He did for me. Those are some of the ways. We firmly believe it, so we firmly declare it. Boldly. Are we having victory over sin, walking in holiness? We'll talk a little bit more about the Father, I think, in our next session of Identity Crisis. But let me leave you with this introductory letter from your Father's heart. It's an oldie but a goodie. And we're going to need some sound up here on the screen. Okay, let me pull this up. Yeah, now find it. And hit play, and then I'm going to mute my mic. So, folks online, you won't hear me, but uh, you'll hear the video playing. Turn up your speakers at home. my song of praise to you, for who you are and all that you do. From the moment my life began, you have been faithful.
said, Father, I've, I've been unfaithful, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Welcome home, son. I've been waiting for you. I No matter how many times I see that, and I see the words, and I hear the words of the song, it moves me with the love of, that God has for us. And, and the, the joy that He rejoices in us. That He loves us, and He cares for us, and He's waiting for us, and wants to welcome us to Himself. That's God the Father. That's the Father who called you. That's the Father who has reconciled you through His Son, Jesus Christ. And now you are His sons and daughters. Don't let the world fool you into thinking you're anything else. Don't return to the... Did the prodigal son return to the pigs after his father put on the robe and the ring? Did he think, you think he thought, oh, I want to go back there again. Ha <laughs> my father, how I duped him. He didn't think that. He remembered now who he was. And he would be faithful to the father as the father was faithful to him. Remember your identity in Christ. You don't have an identity crisis anymore. 